Um, the fusion welding processes go all the way from oxyacetylene welding, where I essentially use a flame to melt the uh, material, to uh, the far end, laser and electron beam welding. And just like I said, all the other bonding processes we could kind of think of in terms of surface roughness and surface contamination being the fundamental things that are going on. In fusion welding, we're interested in heating the material to melt it. And in general, not always, but in most cases, we're doing, we're doing surface heating. And for surface heating, it's useful to think of things in terms of watts per square centimeter. And so this is a log scale of watts per square centimeter impinging on the surface. The sun's rays are something on the order of a few tenths of a watt per, watt per square centimeter, if it's a nice sunny day out. Um, in fact, there is some sort of standard sun um, when you have a bright sun kind of at the equator or something. There's one spot on Maui that is equal to 1.3 suns. It's 30% brighter than the regular sun because the reflection of the sun off the mountains basically concentrates and focuses the sun's rays. So if you want to get a suntan in cancer, you can go to Maui. Uh, if you don't want to get a suntan in cancer, you can go to Maui. It's pretty nice anyway, uh, if you don't stay there too long. Uh, anybody ever been, ever, anyone ever gotten island fever? Know what it is? Yeah, a few of you have gotten island fever. If you're on a small island for more than about a week, a lot of people start sort of get this sort of, not exactly like claustrophobia, but you start realizing you're on a small island. My brother lives in Maui, and I was there for 10 days, and after about a week, you realize you've seen everything on the island, there's nothing left, you know, and you just, what are you going to do, you know? Anyway, uh, it turns out that if I'm interested in heating the surface of metals, I have two limits. Below about 300 watts per square centimeter, and on a log scale, 300 is halfway in between, right? 3 times 3 is 10, approximately. 3.1 times 3.1 or whatever it is, is 10, right? But uh, so on a log scale, half, half a decade is, three, is uh, roughly 300. At about 300 watts per square centimeter or below that, you can't melt the surface of the metal. The metal had metals in general. Now, if I was talking tin or something like that, yeah, you can go with very low melting metal on me. Or you could go with a very low thermal diffusivity material like plutonium or something on me. Um, but most metals, copper, aluminum, iron, titanium, nickel, uh, most common metals, if I have a surface heat flux of 300 watts per square centimeter or less, I cannot bring the metal up to its melting temperature because it conducts it away, the thermal conductivity of the steel, is, or the, not the steel, the metal is such, it will conduct the heat away faster than uh, I can uh, store it on the surface, if you will. Okay, so it's conducting away, and I'll prove that to you uh, next week in a <clears throat> my most dangerous demonstration yet. Um, <laughs> what happens up at this end of this scale? At somewhere around 10 to the six, or three times 10 to the six. Yeah, six. Seven. You're vaporizing the metal, and in fact. Here you can't carry, on that end, you can't carry the heat away, or you can't keep the heat there. It's being carried away too fast. Here you can't carry it away fast enough. You know, the opposite extreme. And you start vaporizing the metal, certainly at 10 to the seventh, and I started dotting these things. Depending on the thermal conductivity of the metal you've got, if you've got aluminum and copper, you may be able to go three times 10 to the sixth and still produce a weld. You go to 10 to the seventh or 10 to the eighth, and you start laser or electron beam hole drilling. And it turns out lasers and electron beams are up in this range. In fact, in special pulse lasers, you can get 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 12th watts per square centimeter. Now, just for a few nanoseconds, but, but nonetheless, uh, you can get very high heat intensities. And in fact, that's what they do with laser weapons or particle beam weapons. They're trying to hit them with something like 10 to the 7th watts per square centimeter and you essentially ablate the material. You send a shock wave through the material. At 10 to the 8th, you basically start shock hardening the material. You, you essentially have a little explosion on the surface because you're putting heat in so rapidly, the material wants to expand, but it's got inertia, and it basically, the expansion of the heated metal just sends a shock wave through the material. 
you get 10 to, to 10 to the 8, and that shock wave can be 100,000 PSI. You could shatter the material. So if you get 10 to the 8 on a laser weapon, you know, the thing will just shatter on you from the, from the stress, thermally induced stresses of a shock wave on the surface. Uh, but at 10 to the 6th, we'll talk about what it looks like. You can actually start to weld at 10 to the 6th with laser and electron beam. You don't need to go higher. At 10 to the 7th, you drill holes. And I have passed around that, those turbine blades before with the little holes in them for the cooling passages. And those are electron beam and laser hole drills. And you do that because you're essentially melting the material and blowing it out. And you saw the uh, Japanese movie of uh, high energy density welding and cutting. Uh, 10 to the third is basically an oxy fuel, typically acetylene, which is C2H2, and we'll talk about acetylene later. But that type of flame will give you about 1,000 watts per square centimeter. To give you an idea, um, over here, you may have an uh, open flame. And we're going to talk about what we mean by that. But an open flame, or somewhere in here, uh, you could have an uh, air fuel flame, like a little propane torch. Okay. Uh, now, it turns out that um, a semiconductor chip will run at about 10, um, 10 to 30 watts per square centimeter if it's really humming. So it's basically similar to having a propane torch on the back side of the semiconductor. Here we have arcs, electric arcs, at around 10 to the fourth. And we have resistance welding in here, which is where you pass the high current between two sheets. Resistance welding is a little bit unique because it's not a surface heating process. But I'm going to talk about other things. And you can place resistance welding in here. You can also place. Um, oxyacetylene cutting processes as having some sort of equivalent heat intensity in this regime. And we'll talk about that because those are really volumetric heating processes as opposed to surface heating processes. But um, in any case, every welding, fusion welding process can be put on this graph somewhere. In fact, uh, well, eight or ten years ago when peace was breaking out and everything, um, they were trying to, the, the Defense Department was trying to figure out what to do with the half billion dollars they had spent developing particle beam weapons. And so they had a three day workshop down in Washington, D.C. area, and they invited me to it and have all these physicists who had been spending a half a billion dollars over the previous 10 years trying to develop particle beam weapons. And I think I mentioned these things before. These are high, these are megavolt electron beams. Uh, they built some of them up to 45 million electron volts. You don't really like to go above 10 million electron volts. Anybody know why? Yeah. You'd, well, actually, you, you hopefully do that at lower voltages. The real problem at 10 megavolts is you start you're above what's called the activation limit, and you start turning non-radioactive material into radioactive material. OK? Uh, you've got enough electron energy that you start transmuting the, uh, the nucleus of the atoms that you're hitting. But actually, what you're talking about, uh, but st what Stefan's talking about, um, you, they actually wanted, and that was part of the theory, they originally started developing these electron beams in a vacuum. Um, I guess there's a little pun on that, but anyway, maybe the vacuum of the mind. Um, but the, uh, uh, the idea was that they th could shoot them 30 miles uh, through the air, and the reason you could do that through the air, because you've got all these gas molecules, is you basically would expand the gas, the heating of the air, and the gas would expand, and it would essentially rarefy the air, and you'd be able to dr essentially drill a hole through the air for 30 miles. And there's a certain amount of truth to that. The problem is there's something called the hose instability. I may have mentioned this before. Did I mention this? How it's basically like a garden hose. And so you could, you could actually probably propagate one of these beams for 30 miles, but you didn't know where it was going to hit, so you had to have your target run into the beam, as opposed to your your beam running into the target. And not every, not all the enemy is that cooperative. Um, so they're trying to find something to do with this, and it turns out they could generate power densities here or above, and they thought, well, maybe we could weld submarines together, 
And I went down and I gave this type of presentation, kind of today's presentation, to these physicists to explain how if you're going to try to do fusion welding, it has to lie somewhere on this, on this graph. Now, if I think about it, so really I'm, I'm talking about somewhere in this regime, all fusion welding processes have to lie. We, um, we have, as we go across here, increasing heat efficiency, heating efficiency. And it, by that I mean how much heat is actually going into melting the metal. I want to melt metal. I'm not interested in just preheating the base material in most cases. So uh, if, I've, uh, if I'm over here at 10 to the third, I may have something on the order of 10% efficient. 90% of my heat is just going into warming up everything else around. The base material is heating. Obviously, if I put in heat very, very slowly, the heat's diffusing away at the same time that I'm trying to reach melting at the localized spot. And so I'm preheating all the surrounding material. The lower the heat intensity, the more material I preheat, and the lower the efficiency. So about 90% of the heat energy is wasted down at this end. Up at this end, you're at about 99% efficient in terms of the melting. And in here, in arcs, it can be anywhere from 0.3 to 0.7 are typical numbers in the literature, depending on the type of arc. Now, if I have increasing heating efficiency, I also have decreasing heat affected zone size, right? If the heat affected zone is the region between the fusion line where I melted into the solid for some distance where I've altered the, the structure of the metal, then um, in a steel, that's typically the, alpha, the gamma alpha trans transformation where you go from FCC to BCC, uh, crystal structure. So you actually have a very distinct heat affected zone. I think when I handed around that piece of HY80, you could see a heat affected zone several millimeters in size. It turns out, if you are putting a lot of your heat and wasting the heat and some of it's diffusing away, you're going to have a big heat affected zone. So the heat affected zones over here can be on the order of 1 to 10 centimeters in size in, a, in steel or something like that. Here they'll be on the order of, so I'm talking centimeters, a tenth of a centimeter to maybe a half a centimeter in size. And over here, it turns out, there'll be a tenth to a half a centimeter in size. They don't get any smaller once I go above 10 to the fourth. Anybody know why that is? It turns out, when you get to 50% efficient, you're not putting a lot of extra heat in during the heating part of the cycle. The heat affected zone size over here, when you get to this type of efficiency, is not created during the heating part of the cycle. It's heat created during the cooling part of the cycle. And so it turns out your heat affected zone size for the high energy density processes of laser and electron beam is going to be controlled not by how long it takes to melt, but by how long it takes to cool. And how long it takes to cool is directly proportional to the width of the heat affected zone. If I have a big, fat, heavy section electron beam weld, and I have a centimeter wide heat affected zone, or a fusion zone, I'm going to have a half centimeter wide heat affected zone. Because I got to suck that heat out, fusion, heat of fusion out, of something that's a centimeter wide, and a half a centimeter of it's going to go over here, and a half a centimeter of it's going to go over here. And so I'm going to end up with a heat affected zone size in the high energy density processes that's roughly equivalent to the size or width of the fusion zone. So over here, the heat affected zone size is controlled by the heating time, how quickly you're putting the heat in. Over here, it's controlled on how quickly you can take it out or how much material, how much heat you have to take out of the whole thing. And that's a common fallacy. I still see, I used to see it once a year. Now I only see it once every other year. 
where people say, well, we're using laser and electron beams so we would eliminate the heat affected zone. You can't eliminate the heat affected zone. The only time I've ever seen a well made that had no heat affected zone was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab about 15 years ago. And they were showing me this, this weld, and they were interested in the shape of the weld zone and stuff. It had to do with fluid flow and well pool, and we were working on that at the time. And they showed me these micrographs of this material. It looked like a metal, um, and it had, but it had no heat affected zone. Um, I, I actually saw something similar to that when I was doing research on steels, but it was for a different reason. And I said, well, what type of material is this? And they just kept talking about the fluid flow and the well pools, and they, they wouldn't answer my question. I asked them about three times. Finally, I said, wait. You know, until I, you know, I can't tell you what's going on here unless you let me know. What material is this? I've never seen anything with no heat effects on it. They said, well, it's actually plutonium. Okay. <laughs> so I just looked at a picture of plutonium. Turns out plutonium is like a ceramic. It has very, very low thermal conductivity. And therefore, the heat affected zone can be very, very narrow. In fact, you couldn't see a heat affected zone in this plutonium. I haven't ever had a chance to worry about it since, but uh, fortunately. Um, OK, so you have decreasing heat affected zone size. If you have um, longer heating times here and shorter heating times there, you have increasing travel speed. as I go across here. So all this stuff is, as I'm moving from your left to your right across this one-dimensional one diagram, um, we're going to have increasing travel speed. And typical travel speed for something at 10 to the third might be a tenth of a centimeter per second. In arcs, the highest travel speeds I get might be well, actually, let me go from, let me give you a range, 0 0.1 to, to one, a tenth. In arcs, it might be 0 0.1 to 1. And for lasers and electron beams, it turns out it can be as high as 100, let's say, uh, centimeters per second. So you get faster and faster travel speeds because you're more and more efficient. Uh, you have higher power density, um, and you, you obviously can go faster. Now, if I start thinking about this, and I say, well, gee, let's say my well pool is one centimeter in size. So it's one centimeter in length here. Um, and I'm going to travel at, oops. That's 0 0.1. That's supposed to be 0 0.1. Oh, no, that's, that's supposed to be 1.0. I'm sorry. 1.0. OK, 0 0.1 to 1.0. And I'm traveling at um, a tenth of a centimeter per second. Uh, well, let's just say I'm traveling at, yeah, OK, let's do a tenth of a centimeter per second. So I have a distance d, the diameter of the pool, is equal to, and that's 1, is equal to the velocity times the time, and if that's one, then it takes one second to traverse that pool from one spot to another. If I'm traveling along and I have some point fixed in space and this thing is moving across here, it takes one second from the beginning of the pool to the end of the pool to pass that point. Right? Now, if I'm welding, I thought you used different numbers. <clears throat> I should have used a different number and come up with a tenth. But you can see this is all order of magnitude. Uh, if I want to control that pool, I have to, and how it wets and the two sides of things, I have to do it with a reaction time that's on the order of some fraction of the size of that pool. So maybe three tenths of a second or something. Okay. Now, what is typical reaction time? What's your reaction time? If you're stopping, if you someone jumps in front of your car and you have to slam the brakes on, or you're riding the bike and a car pulls in front of you. 100 milliseconds. Yeah, that's pretty fast. Uh, hmm? 0.2 seconds. I'll go with 2.2. Half a second, uh, you ought to wake up and get some caught caffeine. Uh, uh, no, there, over the science museum, they used to have a little display, and then basically a light would come on, and then you had to hit a button, and it would time you. 
and I think the best I would do would be about 170 milliseconds. Okay, so a tenth of a second, two tenths of a second. You know, if you if you didn't quite catch it at the right time, it'll be two tenths, 2.21 seconds or something. But most people, it's somewhere around 0.15 to 0.25. And younger kids are better. Uh, they play the video games better than the older folks like me. Except I get high, I used to get higher scores because I would watch for the patterns in the old games. And it turns out uh, in the old games with the patterns, if you knew what, what was coming next, you know where to shoot. And so I actually could beat the kids in the neighborhood. I had the highest scores. Um, but it wasn't because I had the fastest free flexes. Now there's a game you can play in a bar. Okay, so we're learning some something useful here, right? Has anyone ever played this game? Yeah, yeah. You know how to drop the bill? See, what you do is they can get as close as they want to to George's nose, but without touching it, and without touching the backside. And I'm a little tired. If he can get the, the game is if you can catch the bill, okay. You know, you, you get the bill, right? Do you want to do this? You're not allowed to go down for it, okay? Okay, now you can up the ante. So if you, if you up the ante and go for Ben's nose, okay? You want to do it? <laughs> you don't want to go for Ben? I don't know what the problem is. I'd do it just fine. Oops. <laughs> anyway, um, the, t the point is, and, and actually I calculated once how to drop that far. You can go through and it turns out it's something on the order of a tenth of a second to go half the distance of a bill. Now be careful. If I, On a sweaty day, I've done this with the class in years past, and I, I go like that and it's stuck to my thumb, and the guy got the $100 bill. Uh, anyway, uh, so you have to be careful. But... The point of the, there is actually a point to this. Um, if I'm doing something over here, it turns out the reaction time to control an oxyacetylene well pool at 1,000 watts per square centimeter is several seconds. And the time to control an arc well pool is something on the order of a few tens of milliseconds. The time to control a laser electron beam well pool is certainly less than a tenth of a second probably a few tens of milliseconds. In fact, I know it's a few tens of milliseconds, but for other reasons. It has to do with the inertia of the liquid metal and how fast you can push it away, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so, anybody ever taken a welding class? I mean, a real practical welding class to teach you how to weld? Not, not, not a class like this. You'll never learn how to weld here. Not, you have. And what they start you with, arcs or oxyacetylene? They start you with arcs, okay. And you did it? And do they start with arcs or loxus? Okay. That's because you guys were probably in classes that we're going to teach you in six weeks how to be a welder. And that's not the way it really works in the real world. If you go over here to Wentworth Institute, okay, where they're going to teach you for a year how to be a welder, or you go down to a place like Electric Boat or something, and they're going to take six months to train you. Because it really takes some skill uh, to be a manual welder. They will often start with oxyacetylene. Um, and the reason for that is it's just like you don't start on the highest level, the fastest level of a video game. You don't have, you don't know what to look for. You, you're actually looking at that pool and you're seeing how the pool is moving and the waves of metal going up against the fusion line. And you're trying to watch this stuff and learn how to control that. A really good manual welder can lay down beads that you would think were made by an automatic machine. And I've been fooled a number of times, and I would have sworn something had to have been made by a machine. It's so uniform and so perfect. But in fact, it was put down by a person who is a very skilled person who gets a very beautiful looking weld bead because they've got a lot of skill. It's, it's kind of an art. However, you don't start out on the highest speed of the video game. You start out with oxyacetylene. Um, and so many times, most times, well, I'd say half the time, okay? I've covered all bases that, time, that way. Um, about half the time, people are taught with oxyacetylene. They say, why am I taught with oxyacetylene? I'm going to do arc welding. And it's basically because you're talking about skill-based uh, reaction time. Now, you go over here and you realize if I can't control, if my reaction time of any human is not any better than a tenth of a second, and I get beyond 10 to the fourth, I'm up at 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth, there is no human that can control the well pools. 
and do the, the sensory feedback to control that well pool. So in fact, the next thing is increasing need to automate. The, the manual processes are going to be down to that in heat intensity, and the uh, automatic processes are going to be arcs and above. Lasers and electron beam always have to essentially be mechanized or automated uh, to use them. That leads to something else, increasing equipment cost. And unless this has worked for the last 15 years, unless inflation really kills me, but when you're dealing with orders of magnitude, you got to have hyperinflation to, to kill you. Um, you can change this watch per square centimeter to dollars per capital cost of equipment. I can get into the oxyacetylene welding business for three, four hundred bucks, certainly a thousand bucks. I can buy I can buy tanks, cylinders of gas, acetylene, oxygen. I can buy a torch. I mean, good torch setup, just the torch. And the regulators can cost you 400 bucks. And you buy a, pay 70 bucks for a cart, and you, you buy or rent your tanks, and then you get yourself your, uh, your leathers and you know your, your uh, hood and everything else. You you spend a thousand dollars, for a process that'll give you a thousand watts per square centimeter. An arc welding setup, yeah, you can go buy an arc welding setup at Sears for a thousand bucks, and that's the quality of weld you'll produce. But if you really want to do real production welding, it's going to cost something on the order of $10,000 for the wire feeder, the power supply, uh, the regulators for the gas, uh, the helmet, and all the other stuff that you're going to have to have. Okay? If I want to do laser electron beam, it's true. I can get a, a, a laser welder, 5 kilowatt lasers nowadays, for 100 grand. But once I add all the automation and the safety equipment and everything else, you're going to be up to half a million or a million dollars. An electron beam, the smallest electron beam welder I, I know that you can get, get is about a half a million bucks. But then when you add all the other stuff, it's on the order of a million dollars. And the, the big systems are going to be, can be $10 million for those laser and electron beam systems in the automotive industry. Uh, so, uh, but order of magnitude, it's dollars for capital cost. Now, you get to go faster, OK? For that, and hopefully, the extra cost of capital equipment ends up paying for the, uh, um, or the, it being paid for by the, uh, the fact that you can go faster. But it turns out, this also leads to increasing production volume requirements. It turns out that if you're the, the people who tend to do oxyacetylene welder are people like plumbers. You know, they got to come in, they got to make 10 joints in a day in a house or a, an establishment or something. Um, arc welding, you can make 100 joints a day or something. Laser and electron beam, you can make 1,000, 10,000 joints in a day. If you work three shifts, you can make 300,000 joints in a day. Or, I mean, not 300,000, but 3,000 joints or something. Um, if you want, well, I mean, you don't you don't need to make three thousand joints in a construction site in a day for a welder. I mean, if one guy could do it, but it takes a while to do all the other things to set fit up and set up and everything. The actual time spent welding is, is gets to be a small fraction of the total time that someone's working. In fact, for manual welding, about thirty percent um, arc time is the max, and typical is more like 10% or 5% arc time. The guy's chipping slag, he's moving the ladder from here to there, he's uh, grinding the surface, he's waiting for the guy to perform NDE or whatever. So the actual efficiency, if you talk about the laborer's time, is very low down here. You start putting this kind of money uh, back at this end into your system, you, got, you want to keep it busy, or you got to have very high value added parts. And it turns out, if you look at where what industries buy 90% of all the laser and electron beams? It's two industries, automotive and aerospace. Why automotive? 
increasing production volume requirements. You know, I remember a VP at General Motors once said, we make 50,000 of whatever it is a day. Okay? We don't know how to make 5,000 a day. We only know how to make 50,000 and above in a day. They love electron beams and lasers because they can pump the things through there and they can you know, have a whole system to feed, feed the welding process. Um, why aerospace? Precision, exactly. And high value additive parts. I mean, you've got to be able to pay for this. So there's two ways to pay for this. You either can make a lot of cheap parts, which is the automotive industry, or you can make a few expensive parts, which is the aerospace industry. There are some things that you can only do, some types of welds that can only be done by laser and electron beam in terms of the precision, the lack of distortion, the access and deep penetration, uh, which actually adds another thing on this, is increasing depth to width ratio. If I go to oxyacetylene, I'll have a well pool that has a depth to width ratio of a tenth. It'll be ten times wider than it is deep. If I go to arcs, I'll have a well pool that will be basically kind of a semicircle. It'll be about a half. If I go over here to laser and electron beam, I can get these deep penetration. I'm just like at 10 to the seventh, I'm drilling holes. Well, at 10 to the sixth, you're drilling holes, but you're backfilling with liquid. At 10 to the seventh, you're drilling holes and you're blowing the liquid out or vaporizing it, and it doesn't exist anymore. But at 10 to the sixth, you drill a deep penetrating hole and the liquid flows around and fills in the hole behind, and that's how you get your penetration. And you saw that in the What Happens in High Energy Density movie, right? So I can get, it turns out, the Welding Institute has gotten in the laboratory depth to width ratios of 200 to 1 in aluminum. It's worthless, but they've done it uh, just you know, for, for a research thing. The maximum you really want is about 10 to 1 from a practical point of view. Anybody know why you are kind of limit yourself to 10 to 1? Yeah, exactly. If I let's let's take let's take uh, let's take uh, 50 to one. That would be a one millimeter wide weld in a two inch plate. Well, one millimeter is forty thousandths of an inch. In a two inch plate, I'm going to miss the joint. Okay, I mean the joint. You know, unless I go to really precise machining, and even then, if I'm off by a small angle, I'm going to miss the joint. If I have a weld zone that's only one millimeter wide and it's two inches deep, gee, I mean that's and that's fifty to one. It turns out five or ten to one is about the most you really want from a practical fit up fixturing type of type of point of view. Okay? It turns out the other reason is you really have to be in a research laboratory to keep your beam tuned to be able to give you parallel sides like this. If you don't, you end up with these wavy-shaped fusion zones. And a wavy-shaped fusion zone are little castings. It's like a sausage, and it solidifies with shrinkage in the big fat areas of the sausage, right? You know, a bunch of sausage links all stuck together, right? And, you know, sure, it'll solidify in the thin areas just fine, but you're going to trap porosity and shrinkage of the casting in the fat areas. So you end up producing defects unless, you're, unless you're, your walls of that deep penetrating zone are perfectly parallel or even better slightly tapered but if you slightly taper them gee even a half degree taper is is a fair amount of uh, extra width in fact there's another good rule of thumb what's uh what if you have one degree i mean i use this all the time okay <clears throat> you know just amaze my science engineering friends with the calculations i can do in my head and one of them is angular calculations at small angles if you know one fact, I learned this from the, the machinist who trained me as a graduate student. Um, one degree is 17 thousandths in an inch. Now, if you punch it into your calculator, you'll find that the sine of one degree is 0.017. Okay? Or the tangent of one degree is 0.017 in your calculator. Okay? I don't care. I don't, you know, for this type of approximation, I don't care whether I'm talking the, the uh, hypotenuse or one of the legs, right? Because the sine. For small values of theta, it's equal to the sine of theta 
is equal to the tangent of theta. Just if you remember that 17, 000, one degree is 17 thousandths of an inch. So let's say I have a half degree taper, which is one degree on both sides, right? Half degree on this side, half degree on that side is, two, is one degree. That means for every inch of height, it's 17 thousandths wider at the top. Okay, than it was before. Well, if I only had a one millimeter wide weld zone, that's almost 50% increase in the width of the zone per inch. If I had a one degree taper, total taper, included taper, on a two inch weld with a millimeter wide weld zone, it'd be a millimeter at the bottom, it'd be two millimeters at the top. Or actually not two millimeters, it'd actually be uh, 0.74 inches. Okay, 0.074 inches, right? Did that in my head, okay? And I didn't even have to figure out the sign of those numbers. You'd be surprised how many times you can. If you, if you get to know these, some of these little rules of thumb, uh, but you have to be old and gray like me and have done the calculations enough times to know what the, uh, the calculations are that you end up doing all the time. Let's see, we got anything else? Uh, penetration, anybody have any questions on any of this? So you see how this one simple graph can basically catalog all the fusion welding processes. And so if anyone comes up and says, oh, I got a great new heat source, all you have to do is say, well, what's the heat intensity? Where does it lie on this graph? And you can start predicting. You can go back to your notes from this class and you can say, well, it's going to have a heat effective zone about a centimeter in size or a tenth of a centimeter. Or you're going to be able to, maximum travel speed is going to be 10 centimeters a second or, or something like that. Um, or your heating efficiency is going to be such and such a number. Um, Again, that's, and in fact, when they asked me to come in and give a presentation to the physicists on particle beam weapons and could they be used for welding, this is what I did. And I said, well, what are your heat intensities? Oh, well, we can get a lot higher than that. I said, well, I don't want to. Okay, I don't need to. It does me no good. Oh, well, 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 we can get higher. I said, well, good. You know, if you want, you want to drill a hole in the submarine, you know, that's fine. Um, uh, so anyway, you have to bring back to reality there. Now, the bigger problem with particle beam weapons, aside from the fact they didn't work, um, actually, oh, it was a physics project, right? Um, in fact, uh, actually, I have an overhead to that effect. It says if it's, if it's green, it's biology. No. If, if it stinks, it's chemistry. If it's green, it's biology. Um, if it doesn't work, it's physics. If it works and no one knows why, it's engineering. Okay? Uh, anyway. Um, okay, we want to go into flames. Um, we're going to start marching across this thing in the next few days, a few lectures, looking at the low heat intensity processes, then going on to, which are flames and electron beam, uh, flames, and then going to arcs, and then going to lasers and electron beams. We'll come back to resistance welding. Resistance welding, I didn't talk to you about the cost of the equipment, uh, but we could say something about that right now. Uh, it turns out resistance welding doesn't follow the, is the only thing that doesn't follow this dollars per capita cost of equipment uh, on the log log scale. I can get a resistance welding machine for ten thousand dollars, even though it gives me the equivalent of a hundred thousand watts per square centimeter. And you say, well, it's not a surface heating process. How can you say it's the equivalent? I can say it's the equivalent of a hundred thousand watts per square uh, per square centimeter process in terms of the travel speeds I get, the heat effective zone size, the heating efficiencies. Um, the need to automate, all these other things that kind of come out of a surface heating analysis. If I look and see what does a resistance well produce in terms of travel speeds, heat effective zone size, you know, travel speeds of inches of weld per, per, uh, per second uh, or whatever. Um, production volume requirements um, to keep the machine busy and stuff. Um, all those things. Resistance welding is something like 100,000 watts per square centimeter, but it costs you one-tenth as much. It's an order of magnitude cheaper. So now, is there any question why the automotive industry uses resistance spot welding to put sheet metal together as opposed to arc welding? It's ten times cheaper for the capital equipment, and they're a very capital-intensive industry. So that's why they like it. Um, going back down to, uh, to the um, production volume requirements and equipment costs and stuff, the automotive industry will keep a laser or electron beam unit busy kind of three shifts or let's say 20 shifts a week if they can. You've got to have one shift for maintenance and stuff, right? 21 shifts in a week. Um, they will keep that machine busy because it's very high capital cost equipment. It might be a $10 million system 
to feed all these parts in. But that thing is going to be welding all the time. In the, in the aerospace industry, now I'm not talking about $1 parts. I'm talking about $50,000 parts or $5,000 parts. Remember, one turbine blade is $4,000 part if it's made right. If it's made wrong, it's a piece of, um, of uh, remelt material. and has a value of about $30 a pound. Um, but it turns out the, uh, uh, the on time for an aerospace electron beam machine is probably on the order of 1% or 2% of the workday. Mostly it's sitting there waiting for something to be brought to it. So it's a very, two very different industries. You don't care about the cost of the machine. You care about making the perfect weld in the part. Okay, because you've got a $50,000 part and if you turn it into scrap, you have a zero part, dollar part, right? So that's another thing. Okay. Let's talk about flames. And I mentioned that an oxyacetylene flame is about 1,000 watts per square centimeter. Different, different fuels burn at different temperatures. And the things that are important are the enthalpy of the reaction. How much heat does it give off? It also is important is the stoichiometry. of the oxygen to fuel ratio. And the third thing that is critical is the presence of inerts, such as nitrogen in air. That's a for example. Right? Um, if I want to get the highest temperature flame, and the highest temperature flame will give me the greatest heat intensity, I want to have the highest enthalpy of the reaction. And what uh, hydrocarbon will give me the greatest enthalpy of reaction? Seven. Settling, right. C2, H2, basically it's a triple bonded carbon with hydrogen on either side. Okay. Um, C2, H2, triple bonded carbon. A lot of energy released when you break that bond, that triple bond. Now, propylene is or actually it's propadiene. Or, no, I, I have to go back and look. Um, uh, no, this is this is yeah, this is propadiene. Uh, this is propadiene, which is basically C three H four. Uh, and it's got a fairly high, but basically as you go to bigger and bigger, more complex hydrocarbons, they all start averaging out and to the same thing. Um, gasoline per carbon atom doesn't have a whole lot different energy content, BTUs per pound, if you will, than does polyethylene. Or you can go to a very heavy hydrocarbon, tar. You know, it's, it's harder to pump the tar unless you get it hot. Uh, but, but basically, acetylene has, I think it's about a 30% higher BTUs per pound than most of your other uh, garden variety hydrocarbons. So you want a good enthalpy of the reaction. You can get greater enthalpies than, uh, than uh, um, acetylene. Anybody know things that are not hydrocarbon based? Probably not. There's C2N2, and that's called cyanogen. And if I actually can find, I had a student once who got very interested in this. He was a nuclear engineer. He went and looked it up it's somewhere in here. If I, I forgot to look for it this morning. He, I still have a sheet that he brought back to me about cyanogen and what it is. I think he just looked in the... CRC handbook or something. But basically, oh, it here. Here it is. if you looked up, uh, there's also hydrazine, H2N2. Huh. 
Hydrazine is a material they put into the water of nuclear reactors to try to deoxidize the water, okay, to keep the corrosion down. So uh, cyanogen, cyanogen, C2N2 is cyanogen or oxalodinitrile, okay? Um, if you're trying to convince someone to weld with it, you probably ought to call it oxalodinitrile rather than cyanogen. Um, the dictionary says it's a rocket propellant, fumigant, military poison gas, and welding gas. <laughs> it is a welding gas, so you know. Uh, <laughs> however, I don't know, I've never met anybody who's ever used it. Uh, but it is a rocket propellant and stuff. Stores a lot of en energy because I've got a triply bonded uh, carbon with these nitrogens, and nitrogens have strong bonds and store a lot of energy. Um, so the next thing that I want to do is stoichiometry, the oxygen fuel ratio. Um, if I, and I have an overhead for this, forgot. The, uh, if I look at This comes out of the welding handbook, even though I don't believe in the welding handbook very much. Um, this is the fuel in mixture by volume from zero to 100%. This is the normal combustion velocity. Over here, I have um, BTUs per, per square foot uh, per, per second, BTUs per square foot per second. But in any case, in every case, I have a stoichiometric mixture and I have a burning velocity or I have a BTUs that are being given off, the stoichiometric mixture is near the peak of these things. And as I get to a different ratio, too much fuel or too little fuel, this is a rich mixture, this is a lean mixture over here, I'm going to drop the temperature dramatically. Or, uh, whether it's temperature or burning velocity, if you apply temperature, you can see similar types of things. Different hydrocarbons are going to have different things. Here's propane, meth methane, acetylene, hydrogen, which has no carbon, so you're essentially marching from three carbons to one carbon to two triple bonded carbons to all hydrogen, okay? And this is, what is this? I don't even know what that is. Um, but in any case, big sharp peaks. You've got, to get the highest temperature, you got to be near stoichiometry. Otherwise, all you're doing is if you're rich, you have a lot of unburned fuel. And it's basically like inerts. The heat of reaction, let's say you've got 20% of your atoms reacting, the other 80% is just baggage, so that 20% has to use this enthalpy to heat up. And so it's gonna drop the temperature, the maximum temperature you can get, because you don't have all the atoms participating in the reaction. This is like, sort of like society and welfare, right? How many people are on welfare? How many people are working and paying the bills? If everybody's working, you get the highest temperature, the greatest productivity. Uh, if you got a lot of people who are basically living off the rest of the society, the inerts, then you've got uh, a problem here uh, in terms of trying to get high productivity or high, high kind of and great level of social commentary. Uh, in any case, um, that also means that an air fuel mixture, if I go back to this guy over here, uh, an air fuel mixture has about an order of magnitude lower um, heat intensity than an oxy fuel mixture. If I use pure oxygen to burn and have no nitrogen around, I can get about 10 times the heat intensity. Now, it's not really 10 times the temperature. It's only about double the temperature. But for other reasons that we'll go over next time, um, the combustion intensity is a complex function of the temperature, the velocity of the gas, and other things. But we'll cover that next Wednesday. Thanks.